On the night of May 31st, 2003, 37-year-old Sandy Razo stood behind the bar at the Green Iguana Bar and Grill, not far from the beach in Rocky Point, Florida. The summer crowds had already started arriving in waves to the area, and so the place that night was totally packed. Music was blaring, people were dancing and shouting, and the line at the bar just kept getting longer. Sandy saw a man wave her down, so she walked over to him, she leaned across the bar so she could hear his order over the music, and then she smiled. And Sandy's smile showed off her perfect teeth that seemed even whiter than they really were because of her very bronze tanned skin. She also had long hair with blonde highlights and the body of someone who worked out all the time. And when she was younger, Sandy had worked as a fitness model and she still had dreams of becoming a movie star someday. Because of her looks, men at the bar often made it a point to order their drinks from Sandy instead of one of the other bartenders. And the men almost always told her how pretty she was. And that night was no different. Sandy poured the man his drink and slid it across the bar to him, and right away he told her she was totally beautiful and he left her a great tip. Sandy smiled again and then moved on to the next customer. Sandy used to love all the attention she got from men at the bar, but over the last year or so, she had stopped trusting people, especially men, like she used to. So she had started to keep her guard up a little more at work. For most of her life, Sandy had always thought the best of people, and she believed that when you treated others with kindness, they would do the same to you. But that had all changed for Sandy about a year earlier, after she'd had a horrible experience with a man who she thought was one of her best friends. That man, Tracy Humphrey, had been a part-time bouncer at the last place Sandy had worked as a bartender. Tracy was this big, 6-foot-2-inch tall, bald guy who looked like a big weightlifter, he was actually known as Mr. Clean because he looked like the big bulky guy on the labels of Mr. Clean cleaning products. Tracy and Sandy had first bonded over their love of fitness, and when Sandy found out Tracy worked as a trainer at a gym, she had started taking classes from him. Sandy also loved that Tracy had connections to Hollywood. He claimed he'd been the stunt double for the action movie star Vin Diesel, and that he had worked as Tom Cruise's personal bodyguard. And when Sandy would tell her friends that she still dreamed of acting in movies someday, Tracy was one of the only ones who told her that her dream really could still come true. And so Sandy had hoped that she and Tracy would be friends forever because they got along so well and he supported her dreams and she always felt relaxed and safe with him. But then one night when they had been hanging out at Sandy's place, Tracy had tried to pressure Sandy into having sex with him. Sandy got upset and said that was not what she wanted and she made that clear to Tracy but when Sandy turned him down, Tracy had gotten angry and gone into a rage. And so, soon after that incident, Sandy had left that job and started working instead at the Green Iguana, so she wouldn't have to see Tracy anymore at work. But even after she had quit, Tracy had kept calling her and bothering her. But by May of 2003, the calls had finally stopped. Sandy heard a rumor that Tracy had started dating a 20-year-old woman named Ashley, so she thought maybe that meant he would leave her alone for good. From behind the bar at the Green Iguana, Sandy could see the crowd was finally starting to thin out. Her feet were aching from standing up all night, and she was excited her shift was ending and she could finally go home. A little while later, she checked in with her manager to say she was leaving, she counted her tips for the night, and then walked through the kitchen towards the back of the building. While Sandy was getting ready to leave, people outside were making their way from one bar to the next, and music was pumping from dance clubs and from parties all across the beach nearby. But a short, bearded man wearing baggy jeans, a sweatshirt, and a baseball cap blocked out all that noise and walked straight down the sidewalk in front of the green iguana. The bearded man pushed his way through a crowd of people and then headed around the building to the large parking lot in back. Once the bearded man got to the parking lot, he climbed into his Volkswagen Beetle car and closed the door. Then he leaned over to the back seat and grabbed a rifle that he'd stashed there. Then the bearded man picked up a pair of old jeans on the passenger seat and slid the barrel of the rifle through one of the pant legs to conceal the barrel when he raised the gun. The bearded man lowered the passenger side window, stretched across the car, and propped the now concealed barrel of the rifle on the open window, and then watched patiently at the back door of the green iguana. It was hot in the car and he could feel sweat dripping down his forehead from under his hat, but he just kept on focusing on that back door. Then finally, Sandy, who had just finished her shift, came out the back door. As soon as the bearded man saw her, he raised his rifle up and aimed it right at her and fired. 
The bearded man heard glass break, and he saw Sandy look around wildly around the parking lot. The bearded man was confused for a second, but then he realized he hadn't hit Sandy. He had missed. He'd shot the side mirror on his own car. The bearded man panicked and looked around to see if anyone had seen him. Then he tossed the rifle into the back seat, started up his car, and sped off. Back in the parking lot, Sandy got into her black BMW convertible like nothing had happened. She'd heard the glass break, and she'd heard the shot, most likely, and the car speeding off, but she just kind of figured that maybe some drunk guy had smashed a bottle somewhere and then driven away. She didn't realize she had been shot at. So, inside of her car, Sandy started the engine, pulled out of the parking lot, and headed home. And after about a 25-minute drive, Sandy arrived in her quiet, well-lit neighborhood and pulled up to the two-story townhouse she shared with her friend, Tony Ponycall. Then she parked her car in the garage and went inside. Tony got home not too long after her, and they both stayed up for a bit talking, and then eventually Sandy went up to bed and fell asleep, not realizing that earlier that night, someone had tried to kill her. The following month, Sandy spent most of her time at work or hanging out with her friends, and she was having fun and making good money, and she felt like her life was moving in a really positive direction. But as good as things were going for her, she'd started to worry a little bit about Tony, the man she lived with. It had become clear to Sandy that Tony was in love with her, and he wanted to be more than just roommates. And Sandy admitted to some of her friends that she kind of liked Tony too. He was sweet, he worked hard, and he treated Sandy like a queen. And the two of them had even gone on a few dates. But after what had happened to Sandy with Tracy, she still wasn't ready to fully trust anyone. And so Sandy had told Tony that she didn't want to have a serious relationship with him and that they were great as friends and roommates, but they should both be able to date whoever else they wanted. Tony said he understood, but there were still times he acted like they were a couple, and that concerned Sandy. On July 5th, over a month after the secret failed shooting in the parking lot, Tony and Sandy hung out for a little while at their townhouse before Sandy left for work. And when she left, Tony told her to have a great day and everything seemed good between them. And Sandy hoped Tony was finally okay with just being friends and roommates again. And when Sandy got to work, any thoughts about Tony quickly disappeared because the bar was so crowded that all she could think about was the next drink she had to make. July 4th weekend at the bar made other summer weekends look tame in comparison. And Sandy could feel her legs burning and her back aching as she made her way up and down the bar pouring drinks for what seemed like a never-ending line of customers. But even though she was tired and busy, she was still in a great mood because everyone was making a lot of money that night and all of the customers seemed like they were really having a great time. And then, after working non-stop for hours, Sandy's shift ended at about 10.30 p.m. So she counted up her tips, she said goodnight to everybody, walked through the kitchen, out the back door, and into the parking lot. And when Sandy stepped outside, she immediately heard a loud bang. And right away, Sandy was startled, but then she looked up and saw it was just fireworks exploding over the beach. Sandy smiled, climbed into her car, and headed home. And a little after 11 p.m. that night, Sandy pulled onto her street that was lined with small homes and townhouses just like hers, and she noticed how quiet everything was. She figured everybody must still be out, or they must have gone to bed early after partying the day before on July 4th. Sandy pulled into her driveway, she opened her garage door, and parked her car inside of the garage. She turned off her car's engine, pulled her keys out of the ignition, and leaned over to grab her purse on the passenger seat. But while she was leaning over, she heard something slam against the driver's side window. Sandy turned to see what had made the noise, and a look of fear came across her face. Then Sandy screamed, raised her feet up, and began kicking the driver's side door over and over and over. A few minutes after Sandy had gotten home, her roommate, Tony, flipped on the light in their kitchen. Tony was tan with short brown hair, and he was only wearing boxer shorts. He'd expected Sandy to stay out late that night, so he'd gone up to bed. But when he heard something going on in their garage, he headed back downstairs to see if Sandy had gotten home. So Tony walked across their kitchen and opened the door that led out to the garage, and he saw Sandy's black BMW parked right there. But he didn't see Sandy in the car. Tony shouted her name in case maybe she was outside out front of their property, but she didn't yell back. So Tony took a few steps into the garage towards Sandy's car. Then he leaned forward and looked in through the passenger side window, and right away his breath caught in his chest. In the car, Tony saw Sandy lying slumped over the center console, 
and her car seats were covered in blood. Immediately, Tony ran around to the driver's side of the car, and as he did, he felt glass pierce his bare feet, and he saw the driver's side window was shattered. Tony shook off the pain in his feet, he opened the door and climbed inside. He pulled Sandy into his arms and tried to talk to her, but she was unresponsive. Then Tony reached into Sandy's jean pocket, grabbed her cell phone, and dialed 911. The emergency operator picked up, and right away, a look of complete calm suddenly came across Tony's face. And when the operator asked him what was wrong, Tony said in a slow, steady voice that his girlfriend was bleeding in her car and he couldn't wake her up. At about 11.30 p.m., 15 minutes after Tony had made that 911 call, Detective Scott Golcheski of the Pinellas Park Police Department was sitting on the couch at his house when his cell phone rang. Ski, as everybody called Detective Golcheski, had spent a relaxing weekend celebrating the 4th of July. But as soon as he heard his phone ring late at night, he knew his relaxing weekend had just come to an end. Ski answered the phone and had a quick conversation with his boss. And a few minutes later, he was on the road heading to Sandy's townhouse. As Ski drove through the neighborhood and turned onto Sandy Street, he was a little surprised this was the call he'd gotten. On a holiday weekend, his first thought had been that maybe something had happened in the part of town where a bunch of people were drinking at the clubs and bars. But when he parked in front of Sandy's townhouse on her quiet street, he figured he was most likely dealing with a domestic dispute that had turned violent. Ski stepped out of his car and walked up Sandy's driveway. He was in his late 30s, and he was average height with broad shoulders and short brown hair. He'd lived in Florida for years, but he'd grown up in New York and had never lost his New York accent. Ski heard one of the officers who was already on the scene call out his name, so he walked towards them in the garage and saw Sandy's black BMW. Glass from the shattered driver's side window was all over the ground, and Ski saw bloody prints from someone's bare feet. And when he looked in the car, he saw the seats and floorboards were spattered with blood. The officer who had called him over told Ski that a woman in her 30s, Sandy Razo, had been shot in her car. The victim had been rushed to the hospital, but she had been pronounced dead not long after her arrival. Ski asked who had called 911, and the officer said Sandy's boyfriend. And he also said a cop at the hospital told him that the boyfriend had followed the ambulance to the hospital in his own car before police had arrived at the townhouse. Ski made a mental note of that. There was nothing strange about a boyfriend rushing off to the hospital where his girlfriend had been shot, but police must have been very close behind the ambulance, and so he wondered if maybe the boyfriend had wanted to get away before having to face the cops. Then, a ballistics expert on the scene walked over to Ski and pointed out where they had found multiple shell casings in the car and in the garage. And Ski realized that whoever had shot Sandy made little or no effort to cover their tracks. And Ski thought that could indicate one of two things. Someone had either seen the shooter in the act, and so the shooter had panicked and ran, or the shooter had very little experience with firearms and didn't understand all the evidence a gun could leave behind. Ski wanted to test out his first theory and see if anyone had caught the shooter in the act, so he and a few other officers started going door to door in the neighborhood to ask questions. But Sandy's neighbors had either been out when the attack took place, or they had already gone to bed, and so nobody had heard or seen a thing. So, after canvassing the neighborhood, Ski went back to Sandy's townhouse. He and the other officers had already been in there for hours, but he told himself he wasn't going to sleep until he was sure they had found every piece of evidence possible at the crime scene. By 6.30 a.m. on July 6th, so about seven hours after Ski had gotten the call from his boss, Ski was still at Sandy's townhouse. He was out on the driveway, making sure they hadn't missed any tire tracks or any other evidence out there, and as he did that, he looked up and saw the sun rising. And that was when he realized how tired he was. But just then, a Toyota 4Runner vehicle pulled up in front of the townhouse, and a man stepped out of the car and started walking towards Ski. And Ski immediately felt a jolt of energy. The man introduced himself as Tony Ponycall, the victim's boyfriend. He was now wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt, and he said he'd spoken to officers at the hospital and they had let him go. And so he wanted to come back home to see if he could help the police who were there. Ski was shocked at how calm Tony seemed. 
His girlfriend had just been shot and killed, and he showed up at the scene of the crime like he was there to just help them find a missing dog or something. But Ski knew shock affected people differently, so he didn't want to jump to conclusions. Ski asked Tony if they could go inside and talk through the events of the previous evening. Tony smiled and said he'd be happy to help. And as they walked across the yard towards the front door, Ski noticed there were scratches on Tony's hands and arms. Once they were inside, Tony led Ski through a foyer with peach-colored tile floors and into a living room with a high ceiling. Tony sat down on the couch, and Ski sat in a chair across from him. Police had found no evidence of forced entry in the house, and Tony said nobody other than him had come into the house that night. Then, with an almost blank look on his face, Tony said he'd been in the upstairs bedroom when he heard something going on in the garage, so he went downstairs to see if maybe Sandy had gotten home, and he told Ski about how he had found Sandy slumped over in her car. But even when talking about the moment he had found Sandy with blood all over her face and clothes and all over the car, Tony remained completely calm. So, Ski leaned in a bit closer and asked Tony if he and Sandy's relationship was serious or more like casual dating. And Tony said Sandy was actually his fiance. A confused look came across Ski's face and he pointed out that Tony had just introduced himself as Sandy's boyfriend. But Tony quickly said that he just hadn't gotten used to being engaged yet. Ski nodded, but watched Tony's face closely to see if he looked like he might be lying, but Tony's appearance never changed. So, Ski pointed at Tony's hands and arms and asked him how he'd gotten all those cuts. Tony said when he climbed into the car to try to revive Sandy, he'd cut his arms and his hands on the shattered glass. And he also said he had not been wearing shoes or socks at the time, and he'd cut his bare feet as well on the glass on the ground. And when he said this, Ski figured that that probably cleared up who those bloody footprints belonged to. Then finally, Ski looked Tony in the eye and asked him if he could think of anyone who might want to harm or kill Sandy. And for the first time, Tony's calm, cool demeanor disappeared. His face started to turn red, he clenched his jaw, and then he said there was one person, one person who definitely could have killed Sandy. And that guy was a guy they called Mr. Clean, Tracy Humphrey. In his time as a detective, Ski had tried to stick to a simple rule, never get tunnel vision when working a case. Over the years, he'd seen a lot of cops build cases entirely around one suspect, and when that suspect turned out to be innocent, the cases just fell apart. So, in the days following Sandy's murder, Ski still definitely considered Tony to be a major suspect. Tony was the one who had found Sandy and called 911, and he had those scratches on his hands and arms. And on the day after the murder, Ski had heard from one of Sandy's co-workers at the Green Iguana that Sandy had never agreed to marry Tony, and she'd actually told him she didn't want a serious relationship with him at all. So Tony calling Sandy his fiancé just seemed totally strange to Ski. But Tony had undergone a gunpowder residue test to determine if he'd recently fired a gun, he had willingly submitted DNA samples, and he had allowed the forensics team to do a thorough investigation of his car. And so, while the investigators waited for all those test results to come back, Ski started looking into other possible suspects. And someone who worked at the Green Iguana had seen a bearded man kind of lurking outside the night Sandy was killed, but they had no idea who he was. So Ski now had Tony and this unknown bearded guy as possible suspects, but for the time, he wanted to turn his attention to Tracy Humphrey, aka Mr. Clean, the man who Tony was so sure could be Sandy's killer. So at 3 p.m. on July 8th, less than three days after Sandy's murder, Ski paid a visit to the gym where Tracy worked as an instructor and personal trainer. Ski walked into the gym and heard the sound of trainers shouting encouragement and people grunting while they lifted weights. Then he walked up to the front desk, showed the man behind the counter his badge, and asked to speak with Tracy. The employee said he would go get Tracy and pointed Ski to a small office where he could have some privacy. Ski thanked the man and then walked into the office, took a seat at a table with nothing on it, and waited. And a couple of minutes later, Tracy walked in. He was 36 years old, out of breath, dripping with sweat, and had a towel wrapped around his neck. Ski was taken aback by how big and intimidating this guy was. Ski asked Tracy to close the door behind him and have a seat. So Tracy closed the door, he wiped the sweat from his face with his towel, and then he sat down. Then he introduced himself to Ski in a low, soft voice. And right away, Ski thought that Tracy's voice didn't really match his body. 
Ski smiled and said he knew Tracy was working, so he wouldn't take up much of his time. Then he asked if Tracy had heard about what happened to his friend Sandy. Tracy said he'd read about it in the newspaper and that he was totally heartbroken. Ski told Tracy that he was very sorry for his loss because Ski believed that it was always a good idea to start a line of questioning by empathizing. But before Ski could actually ask a follow-up question, Tracy suddenly stood up and said he did not feel comfortable talking to police at work and that if Ski had a problem with that, he could contact Tracy's lawyer. Ski was surprised the conversation had taken such a quick turn and it definitely made him question why Tracy wanted to get out of there so fast. But he didn't have anything to charge Tracy with, so he just thanked Tracy for his time, stepped out of the office, and walked back through the gym. And when Ski stepped outside, right away he felt the sun on his face and a warm breeze blowing. The temperature was about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and Ski thought that this was the perfect kind of summer day to go to the beach. And right there, it struck him that Sandy would never get to enjoy these perfect summer days in Florida ever again because someone had robbed her of her future. And that made Ski very angry. He wanted to find Sandy's killer as fast as he could. And the conversation he just had inside the gym made him want to dig a lot deeper into Tracy's life. Over the following week, Ski and the investigative team returned to Sandy's townhouse multiple times to see if any new evidence had emerged. And they also followed up with Sandy's co-workers to see if they remembered something from the night of Sandy's murder that they might have overlooked the first time they were interviewed. But nothing new surfaced. So during that time, Ski also did something that some other detectives might not have done. Ski's father had been a fireman, and so Ski had always admired firefighters and had close relationships with a lot of them in the area. And so he reached out to friends at different local fire departments, filled them in on the Sandy Rosso case, and asked them to please let him know if they had anything that might help him find Sandy's killer and bring them to justice. Ski didn't know if anything would come of asking these firemen for help, but it just made sense to him to use all the resources at his disposal. But as the days passed, no new evidence came in from anywhere, and so Ski started to really get frustrated. And he wanted to move the investigation forward, but he'd run into a big problem. Tracy's lawyer had told Tracy not to say another word to police about Sandy's murder. And that was a major roadblock for Ski, because even if Tracy hadn't killed Sandy, the police couldn't rule him out if they didn't get any information from him. But Ski refused to let this lawyer bring his investigation to a stop, so he came up with a plan to work around Tracy. Ski had learned that Tracy recently married a 20-year-old woman named Ashley, who worked with him at the gym. So he figured if he couldn't talk to Tracy, maybe he could talk to Tracy's new wife. But Ski wanted to make sure Ashley was alone when he met with her, because if Tracy was there, Ashley almost certainly would be told not to talk. So at around 3 p.m. on July 16th, 11 days after Sandy's murder, Ski drove to the gym where Tracy and Ashley worked and parked right outside. Then he stepped out of his car and walked right up to the large windows out front and pressed his face up to the glass to look inside. But he couldn't see if Tracy or Ashley were in the gym or not. So Ski went inside, walked up to the employee he'd met there the last time, and asked if Tracy was working. The man said he was, but that he'd just started teaching a class. So Ski asked if Ashley was working, and the man said no, she had the day off. And that was all Ski needed to hear. He turned around, rushed out of the gym, and ran to his car. He knew he was in a race now. As soon as Tracy finished his class and found out a cop had been looking for him and Ashley, Tracy would call his wife to tell her not to talk. So Ski got in his car, started the engine, peeled out, and sped off down the street. And about 10 minutes later, after speeding across town, Ski hit the brakes and parked his car in front of the apartment building where Tracy and Ashley lived. He took a deep breath, calmed himself down, and then got out of the car and walked to their apartment. After knocking on the door, the door opened, and it was Ashley. Ashley was pretty with long brown curly hair and big eyes, and she was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Ski showed her his badge and asked if he could come inside and talk for a bit. Ashley shifted back and forth on her feet, and she had a nervous look on her face, but she said, okay. Ashley closed the door behind them and then led Ski to their living room. Ashley walked around a wooden coffee table and sat down on the couch, and Ski took a seat in a nearby chair. Once they were seated, Ski asked her how long she'd been married to Tracy, and Ashley said they'd actually just gotten married on July 4th at the gym where they worked. Ski smiled and said it must have been nice to have a wedding on a holiday with fireworks going off all night. 
Then Ski asked her if she and her new husband had gone on a honeymoon right after their wedding. But Ashley laughed and said the following night, July 5th, they just rented some movies, ordered pizza, and just hung out on the couch. Ashley shifted her position on the couch and asked what this was all about. But Ski just kept on smiling and asked where they had rented the movies and gotten pizza from. And Ashley gave him the name of the video store and the pizza place. Then Ashley's cell phone, which was sitting on the coffee table, started to ring. She sat up straight and looked at the phone and then asked Ski if she could answer it. And Ski said, of course, it was her phone. So Ashley grabbed the phone, walked into the kitchen and answered the call. And when Ski heard her talking from the other room, he knew it was Tracy on the other line and that getting any more information out of Ashley was going to be impossible. But Ski kept on smiling because he'd gotten what he'd came for. Ashley had just given Tracy an alibi for the night of the murder, and now Ski just had to follow up on it. So after Ashley hung up and came back into the living room, Ski immediately just thanked her for her help and then walked outside to his car. And not long after that, he drove to the video store that Ashley had mentioned. And an employee there pulled up Tracy's rental history and showed Ski that Tracy had indeed rented movies a few hours before Sandy had been murdered. After that, Ski drove to the pizza place that Ashley said they'd ordered from, and one of the pizza delivery drivers there pulled up their records on their computer, and the records showed that Tracy had ordered pizza less than an hour before Sandy's murder. And then the delivery driver told Ski that he remembered delivering that pizza to a tall, big, bald guy a little after 11 p.m. on July 5th, almost the exact time Sandy had been killed. Ski thanked the pizza delivery guy and then went back outside, got into his car, and headed for the police station. And as he drove, he felt like even though this was great information, it was like he had hit a big dead end. Tracy's simple alibi that he was at home eating pizza looked like it was the truth. And so Ski wondered if maybe he needed to take his focus off of Tracy for a while and turn it back to Sandy's roommate, Tony. But then, on the following day, Ski got a call from one of the people he'd spoken to at the Tampa Fire Department, and they said they'd found something in an arson case of theirs that they thought might be connected to Sandy's murder. And what the fire department told Ski would put his investigation right back on track, and it would lead him directly to the bearded man who had tried to shoot Sandy in the Green Iguana parking lot. Based on the report that Ski received from the fire department, evidence found at the crime scene, and information gathered throughout the investigation, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened to Sandy on July 5, 2003. A little after 10.30 p.m. on July 5th, Sandy's killer had fallen asleep in a compact rental car in the Green Iguana parking lot. The killer was wearing a baseball cap pulled down low just above their eyes, and the thick sweatshirt and pants they were wearing had caused them to get so hot inside of the car that they'd dozed off for a few minutes. But then, the sound of a car door slamming nearby had woken them up. They looked out the windshield and saw Sandy driving off in her black BMW. The killer immediately sat up straight and yelled out in frustration and then slammed their hands down on the steering wheel. The killer had intended to shoot Sandy right there in the parking lot, but now that wasn't an option. So the killer glanced over and looked at their Ruger 22 caliber pistol on the passenger seat, and then they started the car and pulled out onto the street behind Sandy's BMW. The killer still felt a little out of it from having fallen asleep, and their hands were sweaty on the steering wheel, but they managed to weave their way through holiday weekend traffic and keep up with Sandy's car. Then, after about 25 minutes, the killer followed Sandy as she turned off a main road into her neighborhood. The killer eased off the gas to make sure they didn't get too close to Sandy's car. The killer saw Sandy pull into her driveway, open the garage door, and park her BMW inside of the garage. So the killer pulled the rental car right up to the curb in front of Sandy's townhouse. Then, with their heart pounding in anticipation, the killer wiped the sweat from their eyes, they grabbed the pistol off the passenger seat, opened the car door, and ran up the driveway into the garage. Once the killer was inside, they saw Sandy leaning over the passenger seat to grab her purse. So the killer ran up to the driver's side, raised the pistol, and slammed the butt of it into the window and held their hand up to shield their eyes from the glass. But they didn't break the window. Instead, the killer looked down and saw the glass intact, and inside the vehicle, Sandy had heard the sound, whipped herself around, and was looking up at them with a look of fear and confusion on her face. 
Then Sandy began screaming and she raised her foot and began kicking the driver's side door over and over again, trying to open it to maybe slam into the killer. But the door didn't open and Sandy just kept on kicking. Meanwhile, the killer could feel every muscle in their body start to tense up and more sweat dripped down their face and neck and their chest started to feel tight. And in a panic, the killer just raised their gun right up to the window and fired into the car. The window shattered and glass flew at the killer, but they kept on firing over and over again until they had unloaded all eight rounds into the car. Inside the BMW, Sandy was bleeding from her torso, her foot, her head. Blood covered her face and clothes and was spattered on the car seats and floorboards. She was choking, her vision was fading, and she was struggling to breathe. Then everything went black and Sandy slumped over the center console. After looking inside the car and making sure Sandy was motionless, the killer turned and ran out of the garage, back down the driveway, got into their rental car, and once inside, they took a deep breath and put the pistol back on the passenger seat right next to the fake beard they had been wearing earlier that night. It would turn out the short, bearded man who had failed to kill Sandy in May when they had fired at her coming out of the bar and missed, and then had successfully killed Sandy on July 5th, was really a woman in disguise. It was Ashley Humphrey, Tracy's new wife. And on both occasions, Ashley had disguised herself as a man by wearing baggy jeans, a big sweatshirt, a baseball cap pulled down low, and a cheap fake beard and she had made a point to be seen looking like a man by other people outside the green iguana, which is why she was kind of lurking around. She wanted to be seen. But on the night of the actual murder, Ashley, who had been wearing the beard, had been sweating so much that she had removed it when she'd actually gone inside the garage to kill Sandy. And it was the call from the Tampa Fire Department that actually led Ski back to Ashley almost right after he had thought about moving on from her and her husband. On the night of Ashley's failed murder attempt on Sandy back in May, she had accidentally shot her own car's side mirror, and Ashley had worried that the bullet hole in her mirror would eventually attract police attention. So, in a total panic, Ashley had driven her Volkswagen Beetle with the shot upside view mirror to a vacant lot and then set it on fire. And when the fire department investigated what they believed was a case of arson, they had traced the burned Volkswagen back to Ashley. And then when they had talked to Ski about this, they realized that Ashley was in a relationship with Tracy Humphrey, who was one of Ski's major suspects. And so Ashley was ultimately arrested and she confessed to killing Sandy. But the case didn't end there. Leading up to Ashley's trial, she cooperated with police and she said Tracy had threatened her with violence in order to force her to murder Sandy. And she said Tracy had even made her marry him the night before the murder because spouses cannot be forced to testify against each other in court. And it would turn out that Tracy had a clear motive for wanting to kill Sandy because the fight he had had with Sandy when she refused to have sex with him had actually been far worse than most of Sandy's friends knew. On that night, after Tracy had flown into a rage, he had beaten Sandy and raped her. And eventually, Sandy had filed charges against Tracy, and his trial was set to start in August of 2003. So he had gotten Ashley to kill Sandy so the state wouldn't have a witness to prove the allegations against him, and the trial would just go away. Despite Tony Ponycall's odd decision to call Sandy his girlfriend and then also his fiance when talking to police, along with his weirdly calm behavior in the immediate aftermath of Sandy's murder, he was not actually in any way connected to her death. Ashley was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison and is scheduled for release in 2028. As for Tracy, in the lead-up to his murder trial, several women stepped forward and shared their own stories about how he had also abused them. Tracy was ultimately convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Located in the middle of America is a little town called Hartford, Wisconsin. Downtown, they have the biggest automobile museum in all of Wisconsin. They also have a bowling alley called Dave's Lanes, which sells cheap beer and the best frozen pizza in town. Around the corner from the museum and Dave's Lanes are two other very popular local spots. One is called Scoop DeVille, which is an ice cream parlor that's themed like it's the 1950s, and they specialize in raspberry sundaes. 
And the other popular spot is called the Mine Shaft, and it's this big family-friendly restaurant that offers comfort food and arcade games. On warmer days, you can find residents of Hartford out on the many walking trails of Woodlawn and Willowbrook, which are two big, very well-maintained parks that are right outside of the downtown area. And on virtually any day, whether it's warm or cold, you can find Hartford residents packed into the Shower Arts Center, which is a local theater, to watch the local theater troupe perform. But none of these attractions are why anybody knows about Hartford, Wisconsin. The reason we know about Hartford, Wisconsin is because of Jessie Blodgett. Jessie Blodgett was a miracle. She was born just outside of Atlanta, Georgia in 1994 to her loving parents, Buck and Joy Blodgett. And Buck and Joy, for the longest time, they couldn't have kids. In fact, they were kind of adjusting to their reality that they would not be able to have biological children when Joy discovered she was pregnant. The couple couldn't believe it. It was like the most incredible thing that either of them had ever experienced. Joy would give birth to Jesse at home with no drugs, no doctors, just Buck, his mom, and a midwife. And when little Jesse poked her head into the world for the first time, Buck and Joy fell instantly in love with her. Not long after Jesse's birth, the Blodgett family would leave Atlanta, Georgia, and move to Hartford, Wisconsin. And it was there, inside of their modest two-story home, about five minutes drive from the downtown, that Jesse would grow up. And it was also inside of that modest two-story home where, many years later, Jesse would come face-to-face -face with a monster. Jesse was always someone the other kids looked up to. She was a brilliant musician who could sing and she could play the piano and the violin. One of her very close friends growing up, a girl named Jacqueline Knights, said that whenever she went over to Jessie's house, she would walk in and have to yell at the top of her lungs just to get Jessie's attention because Jessie was permanently playing the piano. But Jessie's musical talents were not the only reason people were attracted to her. From a young age, Jessie became outraged by bullying and unfairness of any kind, and so very quickly, she developed a very strong moral compass. She became a fierce defender of animal rights, environmentalism, sustainability, social justice, and ultimately ending violence against women. By the time she graduated from high school in 2012, Jessie had become very popular amongst her peers and also amongst teachers and parents. Jessie just came off as someone who was wise beyond her years. Jessie always talked about wanting to change the world, and after high school, she kind of figured out how she was going to do that. She decided she would study to become a choir director for either a university or a high school because through that role, she would be able to teach and mentor upwards of 100 young lives every single year. So in the fall of 2012, Jesse would leave Hartford and head off to the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, which is about an hour southeast of Hartford, and there she would enroll in their musical education program. And during that first year at the school, Jessie did so well in that program that she was offered a talent scholarship for the following year. After wrapping up her incredibly successful freshman year in college, Jessie came back to Hartford, Wisconsin to live with her parents for the summer. Now, unlike other college kids that were back home for the summer, Jessie was not treating this break like it was a vacation. Instead, she decided she would just jump right into her musical education career. And so as soon as she got home, she started her own business, teaching voice and piano and violin to kids in Hartford. And within weeks of starting this brand new business, she had over 25 kids signed up. When Jessie wasn't teaching that summer, she was often writing original music with her friend Dan Bartelt, who was also a very talented local musician. Or when she wasn't doing that, she was rehearsing at the Shower Arts Center, where that summer she had auditioned for and landed a central role in that summer's musical, The Fiddler on the Roof. Jessie was the fiddler, and she was very excited about this. The musical opened to a packed house on Friday, July 12th at 7.30 p.m., and Jessie and the rest of her cast were incredible. And then the next night, July 13th, Saturday, they had another big performance at 7.30 as well. And then on Sunday, July 14th, they had a matinee performance at 2 p.m. After that matinee, Jessie and the rest of her castmates headed off to another cast member's house who had a pool, and they had a big pool party to celebrate the end of their opening weekend. 
And during this party, Jessie spent half of her time sitting around the pool with her castmates, and the other half of the time she spent petting llamas that were in a nearby field. Jessie would finally leave the party and get back to her parents' house sometime after midnight, and when she went inside, her mother, Joy, was still awake. And so when Joy heard her daughter, she came out to the front of the house, and she was getting ready to ask Jessie, you know, how was the party, when she noticed right away that something was off about Jessie. She looked upset about something. And so Joy asked her, you know, are you okay? And so Jessie looked like she was about to maybe go into a lengthy explanation about why she was feeling the way she was feeling, but ultimately, Jessie just kind of stopped herself, and in a tone that was less upset and more just annoyed, she would tell her mom, Ugh, you know, the guys in the cast, you know, there are these two older guys that were kind of hitting on me, and, you know, those are my friends, and I felt like they were crossing the line, and it was just, it was just totally uncomfortable. And so Joy began asking some follow-up questions to get a sense of, you know, how serious this was, and it just seemed like it wasn't that serious. And pretty quickly, the two women said goodnight to each other, and they both retired to their rooms to go to bed. The next morning, Buck and Joy got up fairly early around 7 a.m., and Jessie, she stayed in bed, because her only commitment that day was a lesson she was teaching one of her students at around noon, and they'd be coming by the house for that lesson. And so her parents knew she was sleeping in, and so Buck and Joy, they're kind of going about their morning routine. Buck left ahead of Joy, probably around 7 or 7.30, and then at 8 a.m., Joy, right before she left the house, she brought some laundry up to Jessie's room. And so she opens Jessie's door, she goes inside, Jessie's asleep, and Joy, she puts the laundry down, and she considers going over and waking her daughter up just to say good morning and maybe goodbye. But she thought to herself, you know, Jessie never gets a chance to sleep in. She's always got something going on, and so I'll let her sleep. And so Joy just quietly left the room, she shut the door behind her, and she headed off to work. At around noon, Joy would leave her office and head back home for her lunch break. And so when she walked into her home, she was expecting to see Jessie awake because Jessie had one of her students arriving any time. But when she walked inside, the house was silent. Jessie was not downstairs. She apparently was not awake. And Joy had seen her car out in the driveway, so she knew she hadn't left. And so kind of annoyed, Joy walked to the foot of the stairs and she yelled upstairs for Jesse to wake up. You know, hey, your student's going to be here any minute. And then Joy left the foot of the stairs and walked into the kitchen and made herself something to eat. After a little while, as she's finishing making her lunch, Joy hears a knock on the front door. And now at this point, Joy is really annoyed because Jessie has still not made a sound. She has not come downstairs. And so Joy, she goes over to the front door. She opens it up. And sure enough, it's Jessie's student. She asks the student to come inside and wait for a minute. And then Joy hustles up the stairs. She goes right over to Jessie's bedroom. She opens the door up. Jessie's still in bed. And so Joy runs over to her to jostle her awake. But as soon as she is standing right above the bed, right over her daughter, and she has a clear look down at her daughter's face, she freezes. Moments later, she would call 911. Oh my god. Oh my god. Harper 911, what's your emergency? My daughter is blue. I went to wake her up, and I just got home from the for lunch, and she won't wake up. She's oh 19. my god. Okay. okay, hang on just a second. Okay. Trish. Okay, so is she, is she breathing? I don't think so, no. It looks like strangulation marks. There are strangulation marks? That's what it looks like. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Joy would gently pull her daughter out of the bed and lay her down on the ground. She would put a pillow underneath her head, and then she would begin doing chest compressions to try to save her daughter's life. But it was already too late. When police and paramedics arrived moments later, they came into the bedroom and they quickly determined that Jesse was deceased. When police looked at Jesse's body, they too saw the marks on her neck that her mother had referenced on the 911 call, and they also saw the same ligature marks on her left wrist and also on her ankles. As a result of these findings, the police on scene quickly concluded that this was not a naturally occurring death, this was not a suicide, this was a homicide. And so as gently as they could, the police ushered Joy out of her daughter's bedroom and led her downstairs. Because at this point, her daughter's bedroom was a crime scene and they needed to keep it pristine so they could find evidence to figure out who did this. 
Once downstairs, Joy was reunited with her very distraught husband, Buck, who had just come home as well. And the two of them, I mean, their life is destroyed. Their beautiful baby girl, their only child, is now suddenly gone and it didn't make any sense. During the search of Jesse's bedroom and then also the Blodgett house at large, the police were not able to find any cord or rope or ligatures that could have been used to strangle Jesse to death. The police also noted that there was no sign of forced entry anywhere in the house, and it appeared nothing in the house was stolen. And so quickly, the lead Hartford police detective named Richard Thickens began operating under the assumption that the killer knew Jesse and targeted Jesse, that they would have known where she was in the house, they knew how to get in the house, and they went straight for her, they killed her, and they left. When Detective Thickens spoke with Buck and Joy just hours after they had discovered their daughter dead, he asked them if they had any idea who would want to hurt their daughter. And at first, the parents said, no, we don't know anyone. But after some more prodding, Buck would say, well, you know, recently there were some tree limb cutters that were cutting limbs right outside of Jesse's bedroom window. And so maybe they looked in and they saw a teenage girl who was all alone and they came in and they attacked her. And then Buck also said that in addition to teaching music that summer, Jesse had picked up a few hours working at a restaurant down the road. And recently, she had come into conflict with one of her co-workers who began acting very inappropriately with her. He basically would walk past Jesse and intentionally bump into her and rub into her and just get inside of her personal space. And this co-worker was aware of the fact that Jesse was really upset and had already told her family. And so perhaps this co-worker was disgruntled and was seeking revenge. Also, Joy would point out to the detective that the night before when Jesse came home, she had seemed really upset about something. She had said it was about these two guys that, you know, were hitting on her at the party and it made her uncomfortable, but Joy and Jesse didn't really get into it. So there was something obviously on her mind the night that she was killed. Following this discussion, Detective Thickens would go out and track down those tree trimmers. He would also track down the co-worker at the restaurant, and he discovered that they had rock-solid alibis and they were ruled out as suspects. As for the two older guys, the cast members from the pool party that had made Jesse uncomfortable, Detective Thickens found them, and he very quickly ruled out one of them, but he was not able to rule out the other. His name was Randy Talley. When Detective Thickens spoke to Randy on July 15th, the day that Jesse was found, Randy would deny having anything to do with Jesse's death. When Detective Thickens asked him, you know, where were you the night before after the cast party, where'd you go? And then where were you this morning? Randy would tell him that after the party, he went back to his apartment and that is where he has been the entire time until right then. When Detective Thickens asked him if there was anyone that could corroborate his story, Randy said no, he was alone in his apartment the entire time. Shortly after speaking with Randy, the police were still searching Jesse's bedroom for evidence and they discovered her diary. And her final entry in this diary only made Randy seem more suspicious. Despite downplaying the incident that Jesse had had with these two older cast members at the pool party, after Jesse had spoken with her mom briefly when she got back from the party, she had gone up to her room and then made this final diary entry. And in it, she talks about being really upset about what these two guys had done to her. She said that these two guys were corrupting her and that they were taking what should be platonic love and perverting it into a competition. Her closing lines seemed to indicate that she might have been expecting some sort of future confrontation with these two guys. The lines read, I am not helpless. I will recognize problems and confront them without fear. God be with me. Between Randy's lack of an alibi and then Jesse's kind of ominous final message that seemed to be talking about Randy, Randy quickly became the primary suspect in this murder investigation. But Randy's cell phone records indicated that he had not had any interaction, no calls, no text messages with Jesse leading up to her death and around the time in the morning of July 15th when she would have been killed, Randy's cell phone was in his apartment far away from Jesse's house. 
And so while this didn't definitively mean that Randy could not have killed Jesse because he could have just left his cell phone at his apartment when he carried out the attack, what it did mean was there wasn't any real evidence to support the idea that Randy killed Jesse. And so the Hartford police had to go back to the drawing board and try to find new leads to chase down. And on July 16th, just 24 hours after Jesse was discovered, the police would get a huge lead. Three days before Jesse was killed, a young woman about the same age as Jesse, named Melissa Richards, decided to take her dog for a walk in a park in Richfield, Wisconsin, which is a small town about 10 miles southeast of Hartford. When Melissa pulled her car into the dirt parking lot that connected to the walking trail she intended to go on, she noticed there was only one other car parked in this lot and it was immediately on her left pointed nose away from the entrance. It was this blue minivan. And so as she's driving in, she looked over at it and she noticed the driver had their legs poking out of the driver's side window as if they were laying down across the front seats. And so this didn't really matter to Melissa, but she definitely took note of this person in this van. And so she drives past the blue van on her left. She drives all the way across to the other side of the dirt lot. She parks her car. She hops out. She gets her little dog, Remy, out of the car. And then she walks away from the parking lot and heads onto the walking trail into the woods. The trail that she was walking on was basically a big loop that ended at the entrance to the dirt parking lot. And so when she was done with her walk, she would be walking directly across the entire parking lot which would mean she would be walking on foot past that blue minivan if it was still there when she was done. And so Melissa does a 30 minute loop. She gets all the way around and she reaches the entrance to the parking lot and she sees the blue minivan is still parked where it was, except the driver no longer has their feet poking out of the window. Now she can't see if there's anybody in the van at all. And so Melissa, again, she's not really thinking about this. It's crossing her mind, but she's not on edge about this van. And so she lets go of the leash of Remy and Remy starts running to the car and Melissa pulls out her key fob and she opens up the trunk to the car. And so Remy runs over, he leaps into the car and then Melissa just continues to walk across the lot towards her vehicle. And when Melissa walks just far enough that she is past the blue minivan, she turns to look at it and she sees the person who had been sticking their legs out of the window, the driver, is now sitting in the passenger seat of the blue minivan. The door is open and this person is sitting there staring at Melissa. And so Melissa, she makes quick eye contact with this person and immediately averts her gaze. She doesn't want to be rude and she just keeps on walking towards her vehicle. But again, she's not worried about what's happening with this fan. She's just aware of this person and this fan. But after averting her gaze, she hears the sound of someone running towards her from behind. And so she whips her head around and she sees the same person who was sitting in the passenger seat, the driver of this van, has run up to her. And as soon as she turned around to face this person, they came to a complete stop and they were just staring directly at Melissa. They were only about 10 feet apart. And Melissa kind of reflexively said, Oh, you scared me. And then Melissa just turned her back on this person and continued walking towards her vehicle. And after taking only a couple of steps, once again, she heard the sound of this person behind her start running towards her. And immediately she whips her head around again and again. This person comes to an abrupt stop as soon as Melissa's looking at them. Except now Melissa knows something's not right. And worst of all, she looks down and in this person's right hand by their hip is a knife. A split second later, this person charges Melissa. They tackle Melissa to the ground. Melissa smashes down onto her stomach and she's pinned on her stomach. And this person, they attempt to stab Melissa, but Melissa fights back like mad. She turns over and she grabs the blade of the knife and she wrestles it away from her attacker and she pulls the knife under her body and she puts it under all of her weight. And the attacker is so surprised that this has happened they actually stop for a second before kind of reaching down and trying to yank the knife out from underneath Melissa, but Melissa is not letting it go. And so finally, the attacker just kind of sits up on her back and says, can I just go? And Melissa says, no. 
But at that exact moment, the attacker leapt up and started running back towards the blue minivan. And so Melissa, she's not waiting around to see what they're going to do. And so she jumps up. She's still got the knife in her hand. Her hands are completely ruined. Melissa runs to her car. She leaps inside. She throws the bloody knife onto the floorboard of the passenger seat. After making sure Remy is in the car with her, she shuts the back hatch, she locks the doors, and then she turns around and she sees her attacker in the van peeling out of the lot driving away. And so Melissa is relieved, but she also just wants to get the heck away from where she is right now. She's totally alone. And so she fires up her car and she drives to the hospital. After getting 15 stitches to repair the three very deep cuts in her hands, Melissa was transferred to a recovery room where a man named Joel Clossing, who was a detective with the Washington County Sheriff Department, he came into the room and he took down Melissa's statement. Now, Melissa was very shaken up about what had just happened. She had no idea who this person was, why they attacked her. But despite being shaken up, Melissa had the most incredible memory of the event. She knew exactly what her attacker looked like, all the little details, and she knew everything about the vehicle to include the fact that she knew it was a Dodge Caravan minivan. So she knew the exact type of car and she guessed it was probably from the years 2000 to 2002. And so Melissa gives this incredible statement and Detective Clossing, he goes back and he has a composite sketch made of the attacker. And then on this sheet that showed the attacker, there was a description of the vehicle and where it was located and some details of the case. And so Detective Clossing releases this sketch and the information to the media and he puts it around town and he's expecting someone in town to know who this person is because the description is so, so good. And someone would come forward. On July 16th, so one day after Jesse had been killed, a deputy from the Washington County Sheriff Department he came forward and said, hey, I saw your flyer and I read the description Melissa gave about the type of vehicle this person was using. And I have seen that vehicle parked in the exact same spot in that park. I was there a couple of weeks ago. I saw it there. There was something weird about it. The driver was acting strange. And so I actually ran the license plates to see if there was some outstanding warrants or something going on with this person. But after I ran the plates, nothing came up. And so I kind of just forgot about it. But now I've read this description and I'm pretty convinced it's the same exact vehicle. And so I can pull those plates that I ran and we can see who owned that vehicle and, you know, maybe it's a match. And so the deputy, he pulls up the information that he had pulled from the license plates of the van he had seen a couple of weeks earlier. And when they looked at the owner of that minivan, there was just no way they matched the description that Melissa gave. It just could not be the same person. And so briefly... Detective Clossing and the deputy believed that, okay, it was just some big coincidence that a very similar blue minivan was parked in the exact same spot a couple of weeks apart. But when Detective Clossing looked a little bit deeper into who the owner of that vehicle was, he would discover they had a relative that matched exactly the description that Melissa gave of her attacker. And so on the afternoon of July 16th, so one day after Jesse has been killed, Detective Clossing tracks down the phone number of the relative who looks exactly like the attacker, and he punches that number into his cell phone, and he put the phone to his ear. At the same time, 10 miles to the northwest, Buck and Joy Blodgett were hosting a vigil for their daughter in their home. And so all of Jesse's very close friends and family, they were all there in the living room, and they were sitting around in a big circle, crying together, grieving together, and then also sharing their favorite memories of Jesse. And so while they're all doing that, a phone starts to ring inside of the circle. And the owner of that phone, 19-year-old Daniel Bartelt, who was a very close friend of Jesse's and who had spent much of that summer coming over to the Blodgett household to make original music with Jesse, he stands up and he walks quietly away from the group and then he answers the phone and it's Detective Clossing asking Daniel to come into the station to talk about Melissa Richards. Daniel would make his way to the police station that afternoon, and he would be interviewed by Detective Clossing and another detective. And even though they had brought Daniel in to talk to him about Melissa Richards, it was not lost on these detectives how strange it was that Daniel is at the home of a recently murdered young woman where that case is unsolved, 
and he is now the suspect of another attack on another young woman that happened only a couple of days earlier and only a couple of miles away. And so as soon as Daniel sits down, Detective Clausen kind of casually asks him, you know, hey, why were you at Jesse Blodgett's house when I called you? And Daniel would say, well, you know, I'm very close with Jesse. And so we were there as part of her vigil because she was killed yesterday. And so the detective kind of did gradually shift to Melissa Richards, which Daniel would say he had nothing to do with. But as they began asking him questions about Melissa, Detective Clossing and the other detective noticed that there were cuts on Daniel's hands. And so they kind of cut him off and they asked Daniel, you know, how'd you get these cuts on your hands? And Daniel was very quick to say, well, you know, I, I got them at work. Uh, a screw kind of jutted out and cut my hands. I, I move inventory around in a back room of an engineering company. That's my job. And, you know, I just, just cut my hand at work. And so at that point, the police began really asking very pointed questions about exactly how he hurt his hands and what exactly did he do at his job. And at some point, when it just seemed like there was something off about his story about how he hurt himself, one of the detectives just says to Daniel, if I were to call your employer, this engineering company, would they say you, Daniel, are currently employed with them? And Daniel, he kind of paused for a minute and then said, no, I actually lost my job several weeks ago. And so now the detectives knew he had to be lying about how he cut his hand because he's just told them that he heard it at work recently, but he wasn't employed recently. And so Detective Clausen kind of leans in and says, Daniel, so how'd you really hurt your hand? And so Daniel, he begins talking about how he cut it cooking. And Detective Clossing is like, Daniel, nobody would lie about cutting their hand cooking. So why don't you just tell us the truth? And amazingly, Daniel would. He would admit, after some serious pressure, that he hurt himself attacking Melissa Richards. He told detectives that after he lost his job a few weeks earlier, he didn't want his parents to know he had lost his job. And so he had just continued getting up early and leaving the house and coming back later in the day, kind of acting like he had been at work all day, when in reality, all he was doing was driving around town and sometimes going to parks and just sitting in parking spots in parks. And so on July 12th, the day that Melissa was attacked, that's exactly what Daniel was doing. He was pretending to be at work by sitting in that parking space in that dirt lot in Richfield. And at some point, he saw Melissa and he decided he just wanted to attack her. He told detectives that recently he had become overwhelmed in college and so he had dropped out and then he lost his job. And so combined, he was just feeling kind of scared of life. That's how he described it. And so he wanted somebody else to feel scared too. And so that was why he said he attacked Melissa. But despite admitting to this vicious, violent crime against Melissa Richards, Daniel, when asked if he had any connection to the Jesse Blodgett murder, he would say, absolutely not. I love Jesse. I would never hurt her. But when Detective Clossing reached out to Detective Thickens of the Hartford Police and told them you should look at Daniel as a potential suspect in your murder case, it would quickly come to light that Daniel was lying again. Daniel was raised in a good, loving family. He was extremely smart, straight-A student. He was an incredible musician, and he was really well-respected by his peers and even by his teachers and other instructors. I mean, this was a kid who had everything going for him. But something went wrong with Daniel, and no one knows exactly why. Shortly before he attacked Melissa, Daniel had become obsessed with killing and death and murder. His internet search history shows that he spent a lot of time looking for actual snuff videos online. Those are videos of actual murder. He also spent a lot of time looking up serial killers and spree killers, and he was especially interested in anybody who killed lots and lots of women. And then finally, right before he would attack Melissa, Daniel, based on his search history, had discovered this one particular pornographic snuff film, and it was of this woman who was all tied up and hogtied, and after being assaulted, she was strangled. And Daniel watched this video over and over and over and over again. On that day, July 12th, as Daniel is pretending to be at work, he's sitting in his car, he looks out and he sees Melissa, she's all alone, and something clicks in his head where he decides he's going to go reenact that wretched pornographic snuff film on Melissa. And so Melissa was likely just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Recovered in that dirt parking lot after the attack, 
was this special, very strong tape that had been in Daniel's pockets during the attack. It had just fallen out. And so it's believed he was going to use that tape to subdue Melissa and then abduct her. But obviously, Melissa fought back, and Daniel got spooked and ran off. Three days later, on July 15th, it's believed that Daniel decided he wanted to try again. He wanted to act out this pornographic snuff film, but in real life. And this time, he wasn't going to leave it up to some random victim. He needed his victim to be totally helpless. He needed his victim not to fight back. And who better than 19-year-old Jesse Blodgett? his close friend who inherently trusted him and would easily let him into her house, into her bedroom. It wouldn't matter if she was all alone because she felt safe around him. Based on eyewitness testimony of someone who was driving through the Blodgett neighborhood on the morning that Jesse was killed, it's believed Daniel arrived in the driveway of the Blodgett household just a few minutes after Buck and Joy had left for work. And so he pulled into the driveway knowing that Jesse was all alone. We don't know exactly what happened inside of that house. We don't know if Jesse came down and opened the door or if she was still upstairs sleeping. But Daniel, he entered the house and when he went inside, he was prepared for what he was about to do. He literally had a bag full of supplies. Things like that special tape, there were ligatures, cords, ropes, there was alcohol wipes, zip ties. And so he makes his way upstairs to Jesse's bedroom. And then once he's in there, we don't know if Jesse was awake or sleeping at this time. But either way, Daniel jumped on top of her and immediately put a homemade ball gag into her mouth and then wrapped that special tape around her head to make sure the gag stayed in her mouth. And then once she couldn't make a sound, he bound her wrists and her ankles and he hogtied her and then he viciously assaulted her. And then after he was done, he wrapped some cord around her neck and he strangled her to death. After she was deceased, Daniel attempted to clean her body with some alcohol wipes. And then after that, he kind of repositioned her in her bed with the covers up over her to give the appearance that she was still sleeping to her parents when they inevitably would find her. Then Daniel rounded up all of his murder supplies back into his bag, except he did accidentally leave one of those special rolls of tape underneath Jesse's bed, and then he slipped out of the Blodgett household, and then he drove to Woodlawn Park, where he disposed of his supplies into one of the trash cans. The next day, at Jesse's vigil, Daniel would attend, and according to the other people that were there, Daniel was by far the most talkative person in that circle. Daniel would ultimately be found guilty of murdering Jesse Blodgett, although he never admitted guilt. In fact, during the sentencing phase, Buck Blodgett would give this incredibly eloquent and heart-wrenching speech about what it was like to lose his only child. And toward the end of this speech, Buck turned to his right, so away from the judge who he had been addressing, and he looked directly at Daniel, and Daniel looked back at him, and Buck says, Dan, I forgive you as I have every day since I found out it was you. And then a few moments later, Buck would also say to Dan, Dan, not only do I forgive you, but I love you. But when Daniel got his turn to stand up and say something on his behalf, he turned to face Buck and Joy, and looking right at them, he would tell them that he's innocent and that he doesn't have any answers for them because he didn't do it and his conscience is clear. Daniel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and as far as we know, he still denies having killed Jesse, despite the mountain of evidence against him. In the days following Jesse's death, Buck Blodgett walked into his daughter's bedroom, and he laid down on her bed, and looking straight up, he tried to hold his breath for as long as he possibly could. And as he began to struggle, he started to imagine what it was like for his poor daughter in her final moments as she's being murdered. And it just crushed him. He thought to himself, I wasn't there for my little girl when she needed me the most. But instead of just carrying that terrible burden around with him for the rest of his life, Buck and his family decided they had to do something to honor their daughter's memory and maybe even change the world, which was something that Jesse always talked about wanting to do. And so Buck would go on to start the Love is Greater Than Hate project, which is this incredible charity whose mission is designed to end male-on-female violence and to inspire love over hate. Buck's charity is a recipient of a Mr. Ballin Foundation grant, and if you have been moved by the story in some way, I would highly encourage you to contribute to Buck's charity. 
you can find the link to their website below where you can donate. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please ask the five star review button to help you move out of your apartment and offer them beer and pizza as payment. But once they accept and the move is complete, only serve them O'Doul's and anchovy pizza. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We now have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, and my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crimes. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending to the story for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So, that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.